everybody. Thank you for coming to this week's Crowdcast with William Short of Hurstwick. This is William Short's second appearance on our uh, little Crowdcast show. And uh, this particular discussion is titled by him, I thought it was kind of cool, Blood of Emir, Viking Combat at Sea. So uh, would you like to give us a little bit of a background on how Hurstwick comes at the uh, subject of Viking Combat and, and some basic points about it before we get into some questions? Sure, I'd be glad to. Uh, Hurstwick is a team that uh, scientifically researches the combat of the Vikings. We're, we're interested in everything Viking, but uh, most of our focus is on the combat methods, and naval combat is a big part of that. Uh, Viking ships were really the technological marvels of their time. They had capabilities that other European ships of that time simply did not have. have and it allowed them their voyages of exploration, of trade, of settlement, and of course of raiding, and mass battles out at sea, and many other things. Uh, so what I was hoping to do during this presentation is spend a little bit of time talking about the ships, what they were, what they did that other ships couldn't do. Mm -hmm. uh, talk a little bit about the sources we use, because I already see on the sidebar there's a question about our sources, so I'll say a few words about that, and then talk about what the sea battles really look like, huh? how they work, what they were for, what they did. Excellent. So for sources, we try to use every source we can get our hands on. Um, and what's really important to us is there's no one source that tells the whole story. And so we have to layer it, layer upon layer upon the sources. And so we're building almost, if you will, a house of cards and looking for where it breaks. So as we add more and more sources and it still stands strong, it says that our picture is probably clear. But if we add a card, another source to this, this house, and it collapses, it says, okay, there's something not right. There's something we don't understand. Or maybe our original idea is, is not valid. It, it allows us to use the scientific method to figure out these uh, these questions. And so some of the sources we use, we use pictorial sources. And for the Vikings, there's not a lot of those. There's uh, picture stones, uh, there's, you know, uh, embroideries or tapestries and uh, from other cultures, manuscript illuminations, but not a lot. The real uh, important one, one with many, many, uh, examples is the literary sources. And we use literary sources from Iceland, such as the law codes and so on. And we use sources from Scandinavia. And there's a lot fewer sources from Scandinavia. So Saxo Grammaticus, uh, some of the law codes from Norway, and so on. And the question in the sidebar is, you know, how do we know that we're understanding it? Well, we read all this stuff in the original language. So there's not a question of, translation errors where the translator doesn't know some of the details about what he's what he's talking about so we do read these materials in the original language to avoid that issue and that's a real important part of the work we do at Hurstwick is learning and being able to read in the original language mm -hmm. uh, we use etymology the origin of words they teach us something about what the words mean and we use uh, place name evidence to tell us about raids and about naval voyages we use experimental archaeology Sadly, Hurstwick does not have its own Viking ship, so we have to depend on the work that other people are doing in this area, and we follow them closely. But we do, from time to time, get our hands on a Viking ship and do our own experimental archaeology. So, for instance, we were doing some really fascinating experiments with how to row a Viking ship. So we, we borrowed a ship, we instrumented it, we did a lot of testing on how one rows a Viking ship and, and got a little insight into that. And we've done some fighting on board a Viking ship to get an understanding of how this works and the type content of the ship. Uh, and so on. Uh, and then, of course, the number one source is archaeology. We look at uh, ships from the Viking Age. Some of them are burial ships. Some of them are wrecks, ships that have sunk, sometimes intentionally sunk, scuttled to block a channel uh, for defense. And also we look at trading towns where there's a lot of uh, ship-related uh, artifacts to be investigated, such as Hedeby. And we look at the defenses in the harbor, we look at the ship repairs and the shipbuilding evidence that goes on there. 
and the wrecks that are there and the piers and so on. So all of these sources, we try to combine them together to try to figure out how exactly how that work. Now the ships themselves, there are two, two very broad categories of ships that um, we'll talk about today. Here's a, a sketch. The top is a warship, a uh, hair skip. The bottom, a merchant ship, grape skip. Uh, the warships were long, slender, and they were optimized for speed. Speed was all that mattered, speed and maneuverability, I should say. Uh, they were powered by oars and could plant the sails. And an example of one is the wreck from the Pedibi, wreck number one. It's a royal warship. Yeah, but but I think the last part we heard was you you mentioned they could sail in you know, very shallow waters, and then okay. we can hear you anymore. Okay. And the merchant ships, uh, in contrast, their main goal was cargo space. Hmm. Uh, they were optimized for carrying a lot of cargo. Uh, there were only a few oar holes for maneuvering, so the power all came from the sail. Uh, Skuldalev, wreck number one, is uh, an example of a merchant ship. It's uh, a modest ship, it's not a big ship, it's 52 feet long, and it had a cargo capacity of about 25 tons. So what that says is even modest ships could carry quite a bit of cargo. And it tells us something about trading in the Viking lands. You know, even large, heavy objects could be moved from place to place and used in trade. So there was trade in things like Soapstone, as an example, really heavy materials, bulk materials. Uh, the cargo ship had a draft of about four feet, so it needed a little more water. Now, all the ships were uh, wooden ships, um, square rig, single sail. Uh, they were clinker built, which means that you lay the keel and then you build the sides of the ship, the strakes of the ship, the wooden planks that form the hull. You build them up from the keel and then put in the frame, build it all together. And a really interest uh, also, they were open deck. Um, there was nothing below the decks except the, the ballast stones. Um, so there was no place for the crew to hide. Uh, it was certainly open voyages the whole time. Uh, so it must have been quite, quite miserable in the North Atlantic weather. Another interesting aspect of these ships is they were not firmly fixed together. In other words, there could be motion between the strikes and the frame. So these ships could bend and twist. They did not have to take the full brunt of the North Atlantic waves of the seas. So they flexed as they went through the ocean. So it meant that they were much more, they were much less likely to break, uh, much less likely to break up in heavy seas. So they could survive uh, very heavy seas where other ships at that time could have. Um, there's a lot of sub-variants of ships besides the merchant ships and the warships, uh, words that we don't really understand exactly what they mean when they're used in military sources. Turki, meaning a large warship, a dragon, or skaif, which is a swift warship, or snekja, which is uh, a smaller warship that was probably used for the levy troops uh, by the kings, basically reserve troops would use these ships for their battles. Now, in addition to the two kinds of ships, there were also two kinds of crews for each type of ship. So a merchant ship had merchants, footmen, and a warship had warriors, airmen. And it's more complex than this, but basically there, these, these crews were divided into the type of ship that they were on. So an, a, an example of that, uh, the queen, Gunhildir, gave Oliver a ship, and Oliver asked her to crew it with men who were more like hairmen and less like quickmen, since his intent was to use it for battle. That makes sense. Um, and that also reminds yeah. me of the Njal saga, where uh, Skarpathen and, or not Skarpathen, but, but Elgi and uh, Grim Nelson are off of the Hebrides, I think, and they're with the, the merchants, and, it, and it's the merchants versus them in terms of they're being attacked by some pirates. And so the merchants, 
the merchants want to fight, they keep trying to shout over the merchants to make it sound like they want to fight when they don't. Yeah, that's so. There's there's clearly a difference between these two types of sailors. Yes. Yeah. Do, Definitely would, different skill sets. But would there be professional sailors that might be both? I mean, do you have does does a ship? This is me kind of getting ahead of other people's questions, but but. Would a particular ship have a particular crew that was associated with it, no matter what its purpose? Or would the ships have such distinct purposes you wouldn't see that? I don't think you'd see much overlap, to be quite honest, because if you were doing combat-related activities, a merchant ship would not be your first choice. It would be slower, it would, it would draw more water, and so on. Okay. Um, so let's yeah. jump ahead a little bit to the actual zones there. Sorry, another well, question or comment? Well, I was just thinking, so that also means that you would be able to tell probably what the intent of ships sailing into your port was simply by what those ships were. Right? I think so. Yeah. So if you saw a merchant ship, you'd expect it to be full of merchants. Right. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting to think about because I think so often we have just a stereotypical picture of all Viking arrow ships look the same, yes. right? But clearly they're able to read the shape of the ship and, and determine it was from that, that point. That's what you think about. Yeah. So, for instance, if you saw the Hedeby One ship uh, rolling into your harbor, uh, you'd know that it would be crewed with 100 plus people, probably close to 150 people, and they weren't there for fun. Mm -hmm. yeah. hmm. And that's worth mentioning. You know, the, 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 the warships were rowed, um, the sails just planted it. But the rowers were not, you know, galley slaves or anything like that from other other cultures. They were warriors. So the crew rowed. They rowed and fought. And typically there were at least twice as many crew as there were positions for rowing, since people would take time to row and the other half would take time off to do other chores or just rest and then they'd swamp. We don't really know how long the, 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 the time was to, to be on versus off. The best guess is probably two hours or so. Two hours of rowing and two hours off. And uh, the ships are, are measured in what is called room. And room is the space between the thwarts or the cross braces of the ship. And so you can have a rower on either side of that. So in each room, you have two rowers. And since the rooms were about one meter apart, roughly three feet, it gives you an idea of the length of the ship. So uh, the head of each ship was 30 rooms. So that is not surprising that it's 98 feet long. That pretty much accounts for the space of the ship. Um, and so the crews were double that number of rolling benches, typically more than double, and sometimes much more than double. Whereas a merchant ship could be operated with a small number of men, just a handful. Hmm. Interesting. And so drawing on a question that I saw up here on, on, on the side that I think you partly addressed, John Phillips is asking, why, why the Vikings? Why is it that they have these building techniques that, that make them such successful sailors. Is, is there a reason this particular culture happened to develop this, these technologies? Yes, uh, there's two reasons that I can think of. First of all, they live by the sea and they live in lands that are heavily, that have many fjords. If you've ever experienced a fjord, going by sea is by far the easiest way. If you're on one side of the fjord and you want to get to the other, you'll get there much faster in a boat than you ever will on horseback because these fjords are deep, they go deep into the land, and so you have to ride all the way around it to get around it. So they must have used ships and boats all the time, and we're probably always trying to improve them. They depended on fish, so they depended on the, the bounty of the sea to feed them, so ships would be important for that. And they were also trading people. Hmm. The flip side of, of all of that is that uh, if you experience a Viking ship, it's, it's a modern, Pretty scary. And you might ask, why would anybody in their right mind board one of these ships and go sailing across, you know, the North Sea or across the North Atlantic, for that matter? And the answer is, you know, and, and this is getting way off topic, but this whole sense of Viking uh, predestination, you know, the moment of your death has been chosen for you. And if it's not your day to die, nothing's going to harm you. So why not board the ship and go do something exciting and adventurous? You know, uh, if you're going to die, you'd, you could still be home in bed and still die. So why not? Yeah, that's such a critical cultural element that, I, that I'm always emphasizing. It's, it's, 
Yeah. And and you're right. I have I have seen some of these replica ships in, in Norway, and they do seem very fragile. I mean, you it, it's you know the the sort of euphemistic word is supple, but when you're on it, it's you know it's like wow, this this is sort of shifting and that, I don't know it's, it's it's a little unsettling, but you know if I guess if if you don't have an alternative, if that to you is normal seafaring. And for generations, your family's been doing that. It's a different different story than somebody in the past who's used to going on a seven thirty seven. Yeah. yeah. Um, if I can bring up another question in the audience, Annie asked about what we know about the people who built the boats. Was that a prestigious occupation or activity? Um, so uh, that is a whole nother topic of discussion. I'll mention it briefly and suggest, hey, let's meet up again and talk about building ships because it's a fascinating topic. Uh, yes, there are people who are more skilled at shipbuilding than others, but it also seems that many people just built their own ships. Uh, the process was complicated. It required uh, access to large forests because rather than shaping pieces, so the, the, the ship needs pieces of wood of a particular shape, and rather than cutting those shapes, you went to the forest and looked for a tree that was growing with that shape because that is much stronger. Mm -hmm. So it took a lot of work just in the forest to pick the correct trees to fell to make the ship. Mm -hmm. uh, and it doesn't appear that they had any measuring instruments. It seems like the ships were built with some sort of um, you know, arithmetic ratios to, to figure out how they should be shaped. But beyond that, it does not seem that there was any instruments. So they were just taking their axes and they used a wide variety of axes to shape the wood and started chopping to make the, make the ship. Hmm. And that actually connects to another question Shanae was asking, if they were partial to a particular kind of wood, um, Oak is superior, and so the first choice would always be oak. Uh, as the Viking in the early part of the ship, oh, let me start that again. In the early part of the Viking Age, ships were made out of oak, and as the Viking Age continued, it probably became more and more difficult to get oak of the necessary quality and shape to build ships, and they started using other materials, some softwoods, some hardwoods, um, pine, as an example. But it's it's much less robust to the rigors of the ocean. And so you would have to make sure that when the ship was not in use, that it would be taken out of the water to prevent the wood from, from rotting and so on. So oak would always be the first choice. That makes sense. I mean, even though owning a boat is a, a lot of work, from what I understand. So we're kind of circling back to what you were originally focusing on, which is combat. So, to, from what I understand, something like in the ancient world, it's not that they're getting together and they're lobbing missiles at each other, but they're actually bringing ships together and basically fighting with almost a land battle on their ships. Yes. Is that about right? Exactly. So, how do I get into that? That's uh, the, basically the next topic. It's a fascinating topic. How did they fight on sea? When we think of Viking combat at sea, where there's sort of two different forms of battle, one is the mass battle you're referring to, uh, basically a, a, a dynastic battle, king versus king, with the outcome deciding who rules the land. And some of these battles could be huge. And then the other side of that is maybe piracy or raiding is a good way to describe it. And the purpose of that is sometimes personal gain, sometimes political gain, sometimes to settle differences or to gain wealth or property or fame or even a good name. Uh, and perhaps all of these at the same time. And something that's worth noting that I'd like to bring up is these are from the years that predate the Geneva Convention. And so some of the activities done there, we would consider today to be close to terrorism and quite brutal. But to them, it was part of the normal you know, business of, of fighting at sea. I'll start with the, the mass dynastic battles first. Um, 
You know, usually it was a large force under the banner of a king or an earl or somebody like that. So king versus king, and the outcome decided who was going to rule the country. Um, they had to gather the crews. So for a king, that was easy because he had a permanent uh, group of warriors around him, his hearth, uh, which was basically his bodyguard, his chosen warriors. And they would be in the front of the battle. Uh, he would bring in all his earls, he would bring in his other nobles, his landed men, and all of them brought their fighting men. So it could be quite a few ships, quite a few people. And the kings had levy troops. In other words, they had levy army set up. And we know most about this from Norway because of the Norwegian law codes that describe these levy armies. They had to have ships of a specified quality and number. They had to have men of a, uh, that were armed with specific weapons. And these men had to be available when called. And they were called with a signaling system that allowed a, a signal for help to be sent from one end of Norway to the other in a short period of time. And everybody who saw this, this call to arms was required to report. And I think the numbers one in seven of them actually had to go. You know, they couldn't just leave all the farms vacant while everyone went to fight. But I think it's the case that everyone had to report at least. And the sea battles were just as you described. They were really battles on floating islands. And because these all these masses of ships would be tied together. And the way it worked is okay. Yeah. Any better? Yeah, some kind of play grows when you're when you're a little bit further away. Sorry. Okay. I'm sorry too. Uh, before the battle, first men were assigned their places. Uh, this seems a little odd, but there would be a captain of the ship chosen before the battle and a captain of the troops on board the ship chosen before the battle. And it seems like it could vary from battle to battle. Uh, men were arranged on the ship where they stood and where they fought. And the best troops would be uh, in the bow around the stem in the very front of the ship. And because as we'll see in a minute, that's where most of the fighting took place. That's where the hardest fighting took place. Um, the king put his best troops in the very front of the ship, his hearth. And he also had his battle standard there. And the battle standard was something extremely important and extremely honorable, honor bound to protect. It represented the king. And so holding it was a great honor. And it was the pole star around which the battle uh, took place, around which men fought. So it was something very important. Behind that first group would be the berserks. and. The berserks is a whole other uh, discussion. There's berserks seem in the in the literary sources seems to refer to several different types of fighters, and there's a lot of conflicting evidence about what it really means. But the king depended on his berserks right behind his his most uh, selected men, and then more fighting men would line the gunnels, the sides of the ship, and then in the space where the rowing benches were, that would just be packed with men. In one of the large battles, it says that in the space typically occupied by one rower, there would be eight fighting men standing. So th these were just packed as close as they could be. And then from the mast backwards would be archers and other fighting men. And at the very rear of the boat, on the after deck, the king would stand. And the after deck is raised, and this would give the king a bit more visibility about what was going on. And sometimes the king would be protected uh, in a shield castle, a uh, scalpel. Uh, which would give him some protection, but still some good visibility. And the battle location could be wherever they met. Sometimes they, they looked for places that were a bit protected in the lee of an island or uh, in a fjord that was protected or a bay because they don't want to drift onto a hazard while they're fighting and they don't want to have rocking ships because of big seas. Um, and the battle, to prepare for the battle, all the ships would, would line up uh, side to side, uh, all the stem forward, and they'd lash themselves together into a big floating island. And some ships would be working independently, free to sail wherever they needed to be. And at least to my mind, it's not mentioned in any of the sources, but it seems likely that the sail and possibly even the mast would be lowered and stowed to get them out of the way. And our, our combat tests on a Viking ship show that there's a huge number of, of hazards and obstacles in terms of stays that hold the mast in place and so on. 
if you get rid of those, it's just much easier to fight. You don't have to worry about damaging your ship as you fight or getting your weapon caught up in, in, in the, uh, the equipment. And then the battle began. These two masses of ships would start uh, approach each other and they would be grappled. They'd be pulled in. And at that point, the battle began. And uh, the idea of the battle was to clear the deck of the opposing ships, um, basically with hand-to-hand -hand combat. So the idea was you, you cleared the, the, the deck of the opposing ship and then boarded the ship as you did that, and the losers would retreat to the next ship, and then you'd start fighting them on the next ship in the line, and we would just continue down the line. And when you, you captured a ship, you just cut the, 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 the lines that held it to the next ship and let it drift free and just continue down the line until the other side either fled or you destroyed. Now, the conventional weapons were used in the Viking land, so you know, sword, shield, axe, spear, so on, but there seemed to be a number of specialized weapons that were used for naval combat. And these are very puzzling because they don't seem to appear in the archaeological. Hmm. So, Erkir, Kessia, Snarispjot, these are weapons that we've been puzzling over for a long time in our, our combat research. But these weapons are specifically called out in a number of sources. So Heimskula often mentions them in the King Sagas talking about these battles. And they also show up in some of the later uh, Norse material, like the King's Mirror and so on. But these are the weapons that you should have for naval battles. But they seem to be weapons with range. So spear-like weapons that have long shafts, but we simply do not know. And we're truly puzzled by why we don't find anything like this in the archaeological record. It's, it's, it's a puzzle. And of course, archery, bow and arrows. Sorry? And the Atger is very, very important in some sagas, especially Njal's saga, where it's Gunnar's signature yes. weapon. It's usually translated yes. as Halberg there, and I suppose there may not actually be specific grounds for that. Yes, uh, let me speak to that, but just briefly, uh, because we haven't even gotten to the battle yet. <laughs> but yes, uh, uh, Gunnar's Etger, of course, is mentioned again and again and again. And where does he get it from? He gets it from a Viking in a Viking battle at sea. And this Etger was uh, a magical weapon. This, this Etger was infused with magic. And so we, in our research, at least tend to put it to one side because we don't know if the properties of this atgar are because it's magical or if because all atgars have these properties. So we have to be really careful with that one. Um, and yes, uh, he uses it very effectively on land, but again, we have all these sources that say that this is a weapon that's better for naval combat. Hmm. Well, he's an unusual figure, so maybe it makes yeah. sense. A, a signature weapon that's kind of out of place. It's like wielding a torpedo or something. I mean, you know. huh. So there's one more weapon that's used very frequently in naval combat, and we have come to think of it as the king of Viking weapons. It is both on land and on sea, the weapon that men run to whenever there's any threat or danger, and that is a stone thrown by hand. Hmm. And we see it just again and again and again that uh, you know even before battles, ships would stop to pick up stones so that they would have, would have a supply on board the ship. Um, so it's uh, an effective weapon and a cheap weapon, and you control a lot of them, and there's very little cost to it. And so the naval battles often talk about starting out with all these projectiles, stones, bow and arrow, and spears. Sure. When the battle is fought, you know, they, they grapple a ship, draw it close in, and start to fight with the projectiles, the stones, the arrows, the, the spears, and then hand weapons. And so these long-range hand weapons, such as an Atkir and a Snarispiot, would be ideal there because, you know, you are far from the enemy compared to um, the distance you would want to be at to use a, 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 a sword, for example. The Snodder Spio is a, a stringed spear. Um, uh, it has much better range and more accuracy than a normal spear. So it would make sense that you'd want to use something like that for uh, a naval battle. Um, the battles could go on for hours, even um, into the night, it seems like. And at the end of the battle, the loser flees with whatever is left of his fleet or is decimated. 
Uh, usually there's so much debris in the water and uh, so many loose ships floating around that it's hard for the victor to chase them. And so it often seems that uh, the defeated ones get away. Uh, the victor claimed all the land, the opposing king, and it seems to have been the case that the victor would also take all of the ships, all of the treasure, and also any captives uh, that they had as, as part of their duty, as part of uh, winning the raid. So that is mass battles uh, in a nutshell. And the other type of battle is what I would call raiding or piracy. And in our modern mind is what sort of defines Vikings. Um, and I'd like to spend a couple of minutes talking about etymology, the meanings of words, because it's important. A lot of the words that we'll be using don't have direct English translations. So it's important to understand a little bit about the words. Viking, uh, of course, in the old language, it meant either a raider or a dueler. And those are the only ways that it is ever used, it's either a raider or a dueler. Uh, it was uh, an activity done by these northern people in the early medieval times. There's an English term for these, these people that, that did this that's probably long and boring and academic. And so I tend to use the anglicized term Viking for all these people. But when I use Vikinger, what we mean is a raider or a dueler. Um, and this etymology helps us understand what they did was heria, which means heria, uh, either on land or at sea. And the Viking law codes define what heria is. The law code says that it is heria when you seize people or you seize their property against their will. So viking are, are people who go viking, who heria, and they reina, but they do not stella. What that means is they rob, but they do not steal. Another fascinating distinction about the Viking Age people. So uh, to rob is to take someone's property with their knowledge, and to steal is to take someone's property without their knowledge. And the law codes and the literary sources tell us that the first one is okay, and the second one is completely dishonorable. Uh, if you take someone's property without their knowledge, you are a neither, the, the very worst of the worst. And the best example of that by far is from Ayat's saga. Ayat was raiding, he was captured by a farmer, uh, he was tied up with his men, and in the middle of the night he was able to slip his bonds and escape and he broke open the farmer's uh, storehouse and took the treasure. And along the way back to the ship, they suddenly realized what he was doing. He was taking the farmer's treasure without the farmer's knowledge, the work of a needing it. And so this could not be allowed to happen. So he went back to the farmhouse in the middle of the night and killed the farmer. Now the farmer knew. And he, and he says, and my name is Abel, son of a <laughs> That put weight on his conscience. Is, <laughs> so that's that's fun. And and Jason was asking if, if Harry is related to English word Harry, and it is. It's yes. Yeah. yeah, they're cognates. Um, now the many people raided. You know, kings and earls, commoners, farmers, heroes, villains, good guys, bad guys. Everybody raided. It seems like, and there were even landless leaders called Saikonega, uh, sea kings who had no land, but they had fleets of Viking ships who raided. And raiding was a really complex dynamic. Um, and so it's, it's hard to get, just to get into it and describe it in only a few, few words and only a few moments. And so what I'm gonna do is try to, to narrow it down just to two kinds of raiding and leave the rest out, uh, at least for now and be glad to come back and talk more about it at some other time. And we call these two different types of raiding, power raiding and piracy. And the goal of, of these was, as I mentioned before, personal gain, political gain, and so on, uh, wealth. But in addition, there's another aspect that's worth mentioning, that's orthstir. The literal translation is word glory. And probably it means fame, it's not, no, not fame even, but just uh, a good name. And Havamal tells us that's the one thing that survives your death. And it's something that was very important to the Viking Age people. Again and again, in the, in the literary sources, we see the value of Orstir. And to gain Orstir, someone had to do a deed demonstrating courage and daring. And raiding was one of those deeds. 
uh, deeds that gain, gain them frami and virving, which is probably translated as fame and worth, and worth not just in monetary value, but worth as a human being, the kind of man you wanted around you, someone with high worth. And it was expected of a young man to perform one of these daring deeds uh, to show that he had become a man. Uh, so raiding or dueling or something equivalent, putting yourself in a situation of danger uh, with your life in the outcome. And a man who had not yet done this was someone who could not yet call himself a man. So Vikinger came home with wealth and fame, and a Viking raid was what it meant to be a Viking, the essence of being a Viking. And a Viking, a Vikinger, could be either a good guy or a bad guy, and it seemed to depend on just one thing. And that is where it was that they raided. You know, no one wants to be harried in their home. So if a Viking raids nearby, he was despised. He was a kneeling it, and that shows up in the law codes. Uh, it, it, uh, it's very, very clear. But a Viking who raids someplace else comes back home a hero with fame, with wealth, and so on. So whether you were a good guy or a bad guy in Viking Order to just depended on where it was you were herring. Um, when you went herring, first you had to build up a team. For the king, that was easy. If the king was going raiding, that was easy. He, he had his men around him. But for a man building a team, he needed to bring together uh, men. And it could be from any class, high class, low class, anywhere in between. And the only restriction that we can see is age. There seems to be a clear indication that men had to be between 18 years and 50 years to go on a raid. Now, clearly the, the law was ignored because there are several examples of, of men 12 years old, old boys, basically, who were on raids. And the, the teams were called Philog. Uh, basically, fellowship is one translation of that. It was a group of people that banded together for a common goal, a common good, a common profit. And there were super strong bonds between the members. And they agreed that no one will flee. No one will be left behind. And if there is a death in the group, it will be avenged as if the man were a brother. So extremely strong bonds. The size of the team could vary. I mean, you had to have at least two people for every rowing position on the ship, plus a bunch more. And uh, usually you'd go out with a couple of ships. And there are many examples where people would go out in the ships and come back with many more ships, booties from, booty from their raids. Now, the nature of the raid, uh, uh, basically you landed your ship near a target where you thought there was movable wealth. And Viking ships didn't need a pier or a dock or anything like that. You just sail it up onto the beach because they were very flat bottomed profile and because they drew very little water. The warriors knew that because they drew some little water, you could just jump over the side, and the worst would be is you'd be waist deep in water when you jumped over it. Uh, and you could run on the land and start the raid. And you'd fight against any defense that was, was there at the target and take any movable wealth that could be grabbed. Uh, you drive the people and the livestock down to the shore and do a stand hook, uh, uh, a shore blow is the literal transit and basically you're pulling what you've gotten. So cattle, for instance, would be killed on the spot, slaughtered, butchered, and brought on board the ship for food, and people would be sorted out. Some of them would be kept as slaves or as hostages, and even though it's not specifically mentioned in any of the sources, it seems likely that the rest, the undesirables, would be killed on the beach, and then you'd sail away. Hmm. In between Viking raids, the Vikings stayed in a Viking valley, basically a refuge, uh, a place uh, in between raids where they could uh, wait for the next opportunity. And there's two that are often mentioned. One is the Hebrides in the west, and the other is a group of islands off of Sweden in the east. Can you Some of these... Sorry? Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. Uh, some of these had trading centers. Some of them had entertainment for off-duty Vikings. Some of them probably had ship repair facilities. And the raiding season was generally spring to fall. And in the winter, you didn't, you didn't sail. In the winter, you, the raiders went home, you divided up uh, the booty, uh, and you waited to spring to go raiding again. 
Uh, some of the raiders went not home, but to uh, Fridland, a peace land, a place, uh, a land where sanctuary was offered to the Viking, usually in exchange for their not raiding that particular land, a place with no reprisals. So the power raids were basically military operations. You go in and the raiders came from the sea unannounced and they grabbed any portable wealth they could and they simply destroyed everything else, burned to the ground, destroyed everything else. And the goal of this power raiding was political. Uh, a ruler was supposed to keep his land free of raiders and a power raid demonstrated to the people living in the district that their king or leader was not working for them. So it made them less likely to pay their taxes, less more likely to seek another leader, another king. It was a way to attack another king by attacking his people. So it was a very, very destructive kind of raid. And then piracy is just what you'd expect. Vikings lay in wait in the ships and wait for another Viking to go by or a, a merchant ship to go by. And they challenge them to a fight. And if the other ship uh, chooses to fight, it's like a naval battle, with the, the winner keeping everything. And if the other uh, side chooses to give in, they would be put ashore with their clothes on their back and nothing else, and the Vikings would take all of their wealth. And um, land raids could be anywhere that the Vikings could sail that had movable wealth. And uh, piracy, any place that had uh, wealth, um, uh, trading towns in particular, but also in places where Christianity had already arrived, monasteries and churches where there was a lot of portable wealth. And uh, one final comment before we go back to questions, if I may. Um, and thank you very much for all this. Yeah, a pleasure. Everything comes to an end, and that includes Viking raids. And Viking raids gradually petered out, and there were a couple of reasons for this. The first one is there was a, a significant change in the social structure of Europe. At the beginning of the Viking Age, there really weren't any kings, there really weren't any standing armies, there really weren't any defenses for a lot of these places that had wealth. But by the end of the Viking Age, there were kings, there were strong central authorities in all these lands, and there were standing armies to protect the lands. It just made the raids a lot less profitable. Um, it was also a less egalitarian society. In the, at the beginning of the Viking Age, there were many free farmers who had the time and the wealth to put together a Viking raid and go off right, uh, raiding. But by the end of the Viking land, it had really stopped and there were a lot fewer free land-owning farmers and a lot of the farmers were tied to their land with taxes and, and, and fees and rents and so on. So they weren't available to go raiding. The other aspect was the change in religion. Uh, as the Christian church arrived in Scandinavian lands, uh, the raiding was against the principles of the church. And so um, the raid slowed and then stopped. So these people that today we call Vikings, they weren't conquered, they weren't killed, there's nothing like that. It's just that they stopped being Vikingur and instead became Danes and Swedes and Norwegians and Greenlanders and Icelanders and so on. That's well put. And, and I think that, that it's a point that often escapes us is to think about, you know, it's it, there, people, for some reason, I think 21st century and 20th century uh, casual readers of history often look for the sort of catastrophe that begins or ends a period. And there really isn't such a thing. It's, it's this whole societal restructuring that's going on uh, during, during these centuries and several factors working together at once. That's, that's all very well stated. Well, thank you very much for, for, all of that because that was an excellent summation about uh, both Viking combat and the, the the raids, both their principles and their methods. We've been we've had a lot of questions coming up on the side, some of which lean a little bit more toward building ships and a little bit less uh, about fighting. So it would be neat if we could come back in a few months, maybe, and actually do something about ship building. Yes, I'd be happy to do that. So today, let's let's focus on on fighting um, and, and things a little bit more related uh, in the fighting. So let me get some of these questions up. Uh, Peter Clarkson asked if there were any examples of the use of Greek fire in Viking rules. Okay, in Viking lands and Viking times, it does not come up as being a source. 
And I would like to say one thing. The last time that we met here, someone asked me the question, did they use fire arrows? And I said at that time, no. And subsequently, I found that they did. Uh, our further research shows that they did use fire arrows. We don't know that they used them for sea battles, but they certainly were used on land. We have archaeological finds of arrowheads that were likely used for, for fire. And we have several literary sources that are fairly trustworthy, especially Moorish sources that talked about Viking raids in what is now Spain. So the Vikings, when they raided what is Seville, uh, the Moors wrote that they set the mosque on fire with their flaming arrows. So Interesting. They used. And, and by the way, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll arrogantly intersperse a question for me here. Uh, I was thinking as you were talking about Viking combat between ships, you know, one might ask, why fight on the ship at all? Why not just land and fight on, on land? Is it, is it because the ship itself is the, the trophy that's being fought over? It's a good question. I don't have a clear answer. I'll be quite honest. There are examples of people that meet for a naval battle and decide, no, let's just do this fight on land. But I don't have uh, any criterion that helps me explain why they chose to fight on sea rather than on land. Okay. Yeah, it's because it just occurred to me, you know, you can do this more easily if you just land it. But, huh. Um, any answer, if in studying the sea battles, if there were a lot of or SDA events that try to recreate this sort of battle system, you know, uh, something organized like that? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch the question. Uh, the question you were breaking up a bit audio wise. So, so if there are LARP or SDA events that try to recreate this sort of battles, if, if people try to uh, organize kind of paintball like uh, recreation of it? Because you, you talked about about trying some of these fighting styles yourselves on, on these boats. Yes. So I have never seen anything like that. I'm not aware that people are doing it, but it's very possible. Um, what we try to do in our, our simulated combat um, is try to get as close as we possibly can to the actual combat of the Viking people. And it's really difficult uh, to do that because if we're testing some particular combat move and we do it correctly, even with practice weapons, we're going to kill our practice partner, which is not acceptable these days. So we have to really pull back and we're constantly asking, all right, have we pulled back so much that we're not replicating what it is we're, we're trying to test? And that comes up again and again and again and again. And the ship one was a very difficult one. We tried for a long time. How do you replicate fighting aboard a ship when you don't have a ship? And uh, we could not come up with any solution that modeled the, the closeness of the space, the obstacles in the way, the rocking of the ship. And so when we did get a chance to fight on board a ship, it was uh, quite an eye opener. It was not anything like what we expected. Uh, it was so dangerous that uh, I actually stopped one round prematurely simply because I was afraid someone was going to get their leg broken. There's so many obstacles in the way, so many things to trip you up, so many things that you have to keep track of. Um, so people who are trying to simulate combat in a LARP sense, I think, are not going to be very close to what Viking naval combat was like, if I understand LARP correctly. Right. Well, no, I can imagine that the number of obstacles, even if you get that mast and the sail out of the way, you have all the benches, you probably have the chests, you have probably bodies eventually, you have oars, I mean, you know, ropes. I mean, how, how many things are you are you tripping over? Yeah, I can imagine that being incredibly difficult. Uh, John F. White asked about which saga it was for the Viking group back to the farmer. That is Eagleson of Skallagrim, son, or Saga of Eagleson of Skallagrim. I have, I have a video series about that uh, you can find on the channel. Um, Trinae asked a question that I think you kind of addressed, whether uh, anyone could get together a reigning party or if the leaders were designated by a king or, or an earl. And that's something that seems to change over time, right? Earlier on, as you mentioned, you have more people who have the resources, perhaps to do that, but power and, and money to more concentrate as time goes on. So it's probably a different answer in 800 versus in 1050. Yes. So my sense is that anyone who wanted to could put together a Viking raid. Now, if you're doing it based in a country that had a king like Norway, you'd probably want to discuss it with the king or the earl or whoever was the, the leader for the district you were in. But in general, it seems like anyone could do it. 
And and uh, Peter Clarkson asked a question that I, I very often hear um, or hear variations on. Uh, Vikings seem to use islands at the estuaries of major rivers. Did they have maps? Okay, I think the answer to that is probably not. I'm not aware of any evidence for that. Their navigational tools were uh, very limited to almost non-existent. Um, the way they navigated from place to place was by following lines of constant latitude. Uh, and so one of the descriptions, and I forget whether it's in Lanoma book, maybe East Lanoma book, one of the Iceland history books, uh, tells how to get from Norway to Iceland. And the way you do that is you go to a particular fjord in Norway that is at the same latitude as Iceland, and then you sail directly west. And at some point you'll see the Orkneys and you'll see the Faroes and you continue and you'll come and see the glaciers of Iceland and then you have arrived, the glaciers on the east coast of Iceland. They sailed lines of constant latitude when they were in open ocean because they had no way to measure where they were. Uh, the best guess we have is they may have had uh, basically a dial-like mechanism that allowed them to estimate their latitude. There was an obscure archaeological find of a broken one that people have interpreted as a disk for doing that. And I've done a little work studying that, and it seems like if they did, in fact, use that disk for that purpose, they'd be able to find their way pretty accurately in the northern lands without anything more than that disk. They would know how far off from the latitude they were following. Another that, example of that was found. That was found in Greenland, wasn't it? That artifact. I think we're thinking about the same thing. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So no, they didn't have maps. And the way that I usually put it is the best qualifications to be a navigator in the Viking times was to have been to that place before. I mean, you know, it, it makes sense. And, and, and I think that we forget too um, that there was division of labor already back then. You know, today I can ride in an airplane without having any idea how an airplane works. Presumably a lot of the writing sagas don't actually know anything about navigation, right? That a lot of this was passed from, you know, a father to a son or from a shipmate to a shipmate, and it's never going to get close to anybody who's going to write it down, right? So there might have been... I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure that I would agree with that 100%. I mean, the people who wrote the sagas were sailors. Clearly, they had some knowledge of shipboard life and, and how to operate a ship. So I think they probably did have some knowledge of, of the workings of ships. Uh, so, uh, you know, life had not changed quite so much between the 900s and the 1200s when the sagas were written in terms of ship navigation. Okay. I, I think they were probably not too far off. All right. Well, my, I'll, I'll, I'll clarify. Part of why I've, I've thought that is looking at the uh, Vinland sagas. And of yes. course, looking at that from you know, a 2020 perspective, it's really maddeningly vague sometimes, right? They sailed for this many days, roughly in this direction. It's like, you know, what, is, what does that mean, right? What do I do with that? Yeah. Uh, but maybe that really is just how they talked about it. Maybe it, it, yes. really, it was just that vague unless you were there pointing stuff out. Right. And what has been pointed out to me is in the original Icelandic, there is the use of terminology for the features they saw that frequently doesn't get translated well, that this terminology in the Icelandic is very specific and gives a lot of clues to where, in fact, they actually were. Do you have an example? Uh, I, the one that comes to mind is there's a particular type of headland, and you know if you just translate it headland, that doesn't mean anything. But the word is much more specific. A particular headland of a particular shape and a particular orientation is what the word really means. Okay. Okay. I'll I'll I'll, I'll look and I'll see if I can figure out what word that is before I, I get this okay. up on, yep. on you. Uh, Peter Clarkson wanted to ask, uh, do you think the numbers of ships in Viking battles are exaggerated? Some sources say hundreds or more on each side. Yes. And if not, would we start to find more sunken ships? Yes. Okay. Uh, it's a good question, and I don't have a good answer. Uh, some of these battles talk about, as you say, hundreds of ships. Um, and I simply do not know. Uh, it seems likely that 100 ships, that's certainly within the realm of possibility, 
when you start talking about a thousand chips, that becomes harder to fathom. As you just count up the number of uh, warriors, males of a certain age, and then compare it to the population of the land they came from, if it's really a thousand, that's a huge percentage of the total population who's, who's out battling, and that just seems unlikely. A sure. hundred chips? Yeah, that seems very likely. Right, but there's no... I'm sorry? There's no draft to get every single male of, of, no, of that no. age. And nobody's going to eat if you have every single male of fighting age. Exactly. And the levy troop, uh, the, the laws for the levy troops are really insightful there. Uh, you know, there's a number of levy ships in each district all along the coast of Norway and into the fjords. So that's quite a few ships when you start adding them all up. Um, and they were all available to the king. But what was important there was it wasn't a requirement that every able-bodied man uh, join the, the, the call to the levy. It was only one in seven. And it was only if there was an extreme need that they started uh, calling in more men than that. Only one in seven adult men had to be absent during this period of a battle. Well, and I think that that's so important to remember because we have these modern conceptions um, of, of, well, to use a phrase I used a little bit earlier, the division of labor, that really aren't there. Everybody is part of the food chain, right? Everybody is part of of producing food on their farm, except for very, very privileged few. And so everybody that you have on a clip is somebody who's not, you know, sowing or reaping. And that's, yes, that can be exactly. this to me. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And well, this, this worth, that's a good segue, if I may, into one more aspect of ship life that I, I did not touch on. And that is that every member of the ship, everybody on board the ship is part of the crew. So if you're a merchant and you pay for your, your voyage to Norway from Iceland, you're still part of the crew and you're still expected to be a part of the working body of that, that merchant ship, you know, working the sails, bailing the, the bilge, and whatever else it takes to get the ship from one side of the Atlantic to the other. So everybody was a part of the team. Right. Right. There's no, uh, the, 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 there's no passenger, exactly. There's no passenger list. Well, this has been a really informative and enlightening discussion for me. It's given me a lot to think about and a lot to follow up with if you would like to come back, like I said, maybe in a couple of months and, and talk about how we have to do to this. Yeah. And I hope by then we can work out our technical issues. I'm sorry that there were so many audio problems. <laughs> There's always something, you know. I I just price it in personally. I, I really, I, I very much appreciate the time that you've taken with us today. Any, any closing thoughts or, or readings you'd recommend for everybody? Uh, if you want to know the nuts and bolts of Viking ships, there's no better than the books by Crumlin Peterson, who works at the Ship Museum in uh, Denmark, I believe. Do I have that right? Anyway, Crumlin Peterson has written, uh, he, he is the, the dean or the king of Viking ship archaeology. And if you really want to know the nuts and bolts, get some of his books. They're amazing. Uh, if you want to read more about uh, the battles themselves, I don't know of any better source than going through Heimskringla and pulling out the sea battles there to see how it really worked. Um, and there's a and good information about... Um, the, the good translation of, of Heimskringla is the one by Falk and Finlay, which is on uh, the Viking Society for Northern Research Web. And the last one is if you want to know about modern reconstructions of Viking ships uh, and uh, what they're doing, then of course the Viking Ship Museum is the place to go. They are doing amazing experimental archaeology reconstructing these ships. Well, I will put uh, some uh, links on Patreon and then YouTube when I get this up publicly uh, to help people uh, get pointed to that. So. William Schroeswick, thank you so much again for your time, for answering your questions, giving us a great presentation, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next time. Okay, and my thanks to your supporters on Patreon. I really enjoyed uh, this presentation. Thank you. Thank you. All the best for now.